All right. Over the next uh, four weeks, I want to start a new series of messages that I'm entitling Delivered. And what we're going to do is cover some of the major themes in the book of Exodus. And what I'd like you to do today is open your Bibles to two passages. First, go to Exodus chapter 6. Exodus chapter 6, and I want to show you some verses that will kind of help connect the entire book of Exodus together. Then we're going to go back to Exodus chapter 3, and that's where we're really going to deal with the message this morning, okay? So turn with me to Exodus chapter 6, and then hold your finger there and, and go to chapter 3. Actually, it'd be better to go to chapter 3 than hold your finger there and go to Exodus chapter 6, because I'm going to spend a couple of moments looking in Exodus 6, and I want to point out four major themes in these verses. And if you keep these four major themes in mind as you read through Exodus over the next few days, it's going to help you kind of understand it a little bit. By the way, if you're not doing our Bible reading plan, I want to encourage you to do that. Get online, go to it. I know that it's a lot of verses. It's a, a big chunk of Scripture every day. If you can't keep up with all of that, just read the old the section in Exodus right now, and, and you're going to be fine. Um, and then in, in the next four Sundays, I want to I want to share some messages about that. All right. So I want you to notice in Exodus chapter six, beginning in verse one, it says, "But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh." For with a strong hand, he will send them out, and with a strong hand, he will drive them out of his, this land. What's happened here, by the way, is Moses is gone and had his first conversation with Pharaoh, and things did not go well. They did not go as Moses had expected. In fact, Pharaoh made things even harder, and now he's going back going, God, what am I supposed to do? And God begins to tell him, don't worry about it, Moses. Just do what I tell you. Go back to Pharaoh. Look what he says. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. In fact, circle that phrase there, I am the Lord. That's the first of these major themes that I'm going to point out. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God's Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which uh, they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groanings of the people of Israel, from whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out of, from under the burdens uh, of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from the slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from, uh, from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Four major themes here. If you keep these in mind, it's going to help you remember this entire book and connect it together. The first thing that happens in the book of Exodus, and what we're going to focus on this morning, is that God reveals himself to the people, and he does that by revealing his name. You'll notice there are four times in that passage God refers to himself as, by saying, I am the Lord. That name, the Lord, is essential and we're going to look at that this morning. We're going to see how God reveals himself to the people. The second major theme is that God is going to deliver his people. We're going to look at that next week. In verse 6, he says, listen, I've heard, I've seen, and I've come to do something about it. I'm going to come and deliver my people. The third major thing is in verse 7. And he reminds the people that God is going to adopt them. He's going to take them to be his people. And we're going to learn in the next three weeks from now what it means to be God's covenant people and to be a part of God's people. And then he gives them a promise. He says, I'm going to give you land. And that's what we're going to look in the fourth week. We're going to look at the blessings that come as a result of being in a relationship with God. Now, what I want to do this morning is focus on that first theme. I want to show you how God reveals himself. Flip back in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 3, and we're going to park here and spend the rest of the morning on it, all right? In fact, probably a little bit of the afternoon, quite frankly. <laughs> Just preparing you, all right? 
As you're turning there, I want to remind you of what's going on. The children of Israel have lived in Egypt now for 430 years. At the end of Genesis, Jacob and Joseph and their family moved to Egypt, and they live there for 430 years. And at the beginning, things go very well. Everything is going great. Pharaoh has given them some of the best land. They've started being shepherds up there. But eventually, as time goes by, the Bible says that a Pharaoh arose who no longer remembered Joseph no longer remembered what Joseph had done for them and how he had helped deliver them out of that famine. And what begins to happen is he looks at this group of foreign people. (laughs) By now, these, these Hebrew people have grown into a fairly large group. And now he's getting concerned. He's beginning to say, you know, they might rebel. There's a whole bunch of foreigners living in my land, and and I'm a little bit afraid of that. And so he begins to concoct a series of steps. And I don't want to get into all the details, but essentially what he's going to do is uh, embark on systematic genocide. I'm going to wipe them out. And one of them, what he's going to do is going to kill all of the Hebrew baby boys. If you have a baby and it's a boy, he's going to have it killed. But you'll remember that uh, through the very uh, wise uh, uh, mo- uh, thinking of Moses' mother, she puts him in a little boat and puts him out there where Pharaoh's daughter can see him while she's out in the, in the river taking a swim, and she falls in love and takes him home. And Moses becomes uh, a kind of a unique figure. He's a Hebrew, but he grows up in the life of Pharaoh. And when he gets to be about 40 years old, he takes his first step of leadership and it completely fails. He sees an Egyptian beating up a Hebrew, and he goes over and he intervenes, and he ends up killing the Egyptian. And and what ends up happening is he has to run for his life. He literally becomes a fugitive for justice. He goes out into the area called Midian, out towards the desert. Eventually, he meets his wife, and after 40 years of going by, he's 80 years old when we pick up this story, and he really hasn't made it. He doesn't own anything. He's living in his father-in-law's house, raising his father-in-law's sheep. And Moses has just kind of settled in to a life. And that's where the story picks up because God is going to reveal himself. And the first thing I want you to notice this morning is that in the first principle is this. God reveals himself in extraordinary ways during ordinary moments. Look what happens in Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And I apologize, I've got to sit down. My back's bothering me again. Pray for it, but um, uh, I'm just going to sit here. And maybe I'll walk around a little bit, but anyways, uh, mostly I'm going to sit. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame out of the fi- a fire out of the midst of a, a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. I want you to notice what ha- happens. This day started out for Moses like probably every other day of an 80-year-old shepherd. Um, he gets up in the morning, he eats his breakfast, he gathers his sheep up, he leads them out. Now this time, by the way, this is, this is rough life. He has to go all the way to the opposite side of the desert, out to the area around Mount Sinai. When the Bible talks about Mount Horeb, we know that mountain better as Mount Sinai. He takes him all the way out there. He spends the day watching them, feeding them, taking care of sheep, doing all the things that shepherds do. This is the same thing that he has done every day of his life, probably for the last 40 years. In many ways, this is just an ordinary, average day until he notices something. Someone once wrote this. They said that God writes extraordinary stories out of ordinary lives. And that's what's going to happen here to Moses. In this point, he's just sort of an average, ordinary shepherd. Nothing really to notice. But something unusual catches his eye. He notices that there's a bush that's on fire. And what's really unusual about this bush is it's not being consumed. 
Now, things would catch on fire out in the desert like that a lot. Little spontaneous brush fires popped up all the time. But if you've ever seen a brush fire, it happens very, very quick. I remember a few years ago, the field beside Cliff's house caught on fire. I don't know what was going on, but it caught on fire. And it was a scary situation, don't get me wrong, but it didn't last very long. I mean, it just moved right through that dry grass, took it out. You've, you've probably all seen a cornfield down here catch on fire. Doesn't take very long. That whole cornfield just goes up. That's what Moses is thinking is going to happen. He notices something. This bush is not being consumed. And verse 2 tells us there's something really spectacular, something extraordinary about this bush. Notice what he says in verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him. Now, I want you to notice something. This is no normal angel. The Bible talks about the angel of the Lord, and the angel of the Lord is very interesting. This is no run-of-the-mill angel. Now, the Bible tells us angels are simply messengers, And most of the time we see them, they'll appear, they'll give the message, and they go away. All right? But when we see the phrase, the angel of the Lord, he's drawing our attention to there's something very different about this person. We've met him twice already as we've been reading our Bible. We saw him back in Genesis chapter 16. He appeared to Hagar when she was running from Sarah, and he promised to protect Ishmael. The angel of the Lord also appeared to Mo, or to, uh, uh, Abra- <laughs> to Abraham in Genesis chapter 22 when he intervened. You remember when God told him to sacrifice his son? The angel of the Lord intervened. Now, what's unusual about this angel is the way the Bible talks about him. We saw him in Genesis chapter 22, verse 32. And there, Jacob refers to him as being the Lord calls him God. Not only that, you'll find out that later on in Exodus, this same angel of the Lord, listen to what God says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 20 and 21. Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Pay careful attention to him. Obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. Here he says that the angel of the Lord, two really odd things. My name is in him. Now, the name in the Old Testament is very very important. And God says, my name, my character, my nature is in this angel. And not only that, he has the ability to pardon sin. The only person that can do that is God. This angel of the Lord is the visible representation of God in the Old Testament. Let me make this easy. That's Jesus. That is the pre-incarnate Lord, Jesus, speaking to Moses out of this burning bush. Now, what happened as as an ordinary day of just tending his flocks becomes a life-changing encounter with God for Moses. God took an ordinary day in the life of an ordinary man and he turned it into a moment that we're still talking about 4,000 years later because God reveals himself and his plan to Moses in this moment. And I want you to hear this. Um, If you think about it, that's the way how God does often. When we've been looking through the Bible, think about Abraham for a moment. Abraham's just going about his life living out there in Ur of the Chaldees. He didn't know anything about God. But then one day, God spoke to him, and God called him. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah is going through maybe a little bit of an unusual day, but in another way, kind of ordinary. He's mourning the death of the king, and he goes to the temple, and God meets him in an extraordinary way. That's the way it is in our life. In Mark chapter 1, a group of ordinary fishermen went out one day, doing the things they did every day, (laughs) tending their nets, trying to catch the fish. I I think it almost like the, you know, they were probably felt like that. Remember the donut guy? Remember back the Dunkin' Donuts commercial from probably the 1980s? This is going to date me. All right. When the guy would get up, he'd say, time to make the donuts. Y'all remember that commercial? No, you're too young if you don't remember that. All right. But uh, the fisherman got up one day and said, oh, time time to catch the fish. Jesus met them that day. That's the way God works. 
In our ordinary daily life routine, God sometimes shows up and meets us. Listen to me. There is a treasure in the ordinary. We think about that. We have a Bible reading plan in our church. And by the way, I know it. It's a lot of Bible to read. And again, if you need to cut it back a little bit and just read from the Old Testament or from the New Testament, I understand that. The important part is not how much you read, it's that you're reading. And sometimes that can become kind of an ordinary thing. I get up every morning, and um, after I, if, if Max is there on that day, after he calls me a dirty rat and gets me up and we make him a little bit of breakfast, there's a little, I've got a little notice that pops up on my, my phone that says, this is the Bible reading plan. Time to read the Bible. But I want to say this to you, that in that ordinary day, the ordinary rhythms of life, God sometimes shows up and meets with us. There is a treasure in the ordinary. Don't neglect those. Always be watching and waiting for those small, ordinary moments where God is going to come and speak to you. I'm afraid that sometimes we love the big moments. Listen to me. Last year, if you're new here, last year, God started moving in our church in an amazing way right about this time of the year. It happened right about the time that our students were going off to the winter retreat, and they're getting ready to do it here again in just a couple of weeks. And I want to say this to you, God really began moving a few weeks ahead of that, now looking back. But, but that trip was an amazing moment. I want to tell you this, it was one of the most momentous moments I've ever seen God move in all of my ministry. And we want to replicate that sometimes. But I want you to remember where that started. It was in the ordinary, daily, read the Bible, pray, worship, witness, share the gospel with other people. The ordinary part of life. God met us, and it was spectacular. But we can't replicate that. God meets us in the ordinary. Second thing I want to point out. God reveals his holiness to meet our unrighteousness. Very important what happens. Look at, look at the next verses. Verse three, and Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And look what Moses responds. He said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off for your, your, off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground you got to really pay attention to that because it's important to note that the very first thing that God reveals about his character in this passage is his holiness. Notice how he does that. He says, first of all, Moses, stand back. Don't get too close. If you look at the Old Testament, a lot of Old Testament worship tells us this. God is holy. Stay back. Stay back. Because if you get too close, he'll kill you. If you get too close, his holiness will jump out and, and overwhelm you. So he makes it. All the things about the temple are about barriers. Why is that? Well, because the, we go back to Genesis chapter 3 and we understand we have a sin problem. God is holy. He is perfect. We are sinners. We are unrighteous. And therefore, when we come into his presence, it is a very terrifying thing. Now, let's talk about holiness for just a moment. Holiness is the central attribute of God's character. When we think about what God is like, the first thing that should come to our mind is that he is holy. How do we know that? In Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah goes into the temple and God reveals himself, he sees God high and lifted up. You remember that the angels, the seraphim, are flying around the throne. And boy, I can't even get imagine what that must have been like. And they're crying out, holy, holy, holy. Now, some people thought that's a reference to the Trinity. It's not. When they repeat it three times, it's saying this is the essence of what God is. The word holy simply means this. He is set apart. He is set apart. Thomas Brooks said, God's holiness and his nature are not two things. They are one. God's holiness is his nature, and God's nature is his holiness. When we say that, that God is holy, what we're ultimately saying is that he is unique. He is set apart from everything else in the universe. He is 
completely different. I'll give you an example. He is eternal. Everything else has a beginning. <laughs> Maybe no end, but certainly has a beginning. God has neither, no beginning or no end. And he's going to reveal that, and I'll show you this in a couple moments, by the name that he gives him. But we've got to stop and we've got to understand this. When we're thinking about God, he is absolutely perfect in every way. He's completely unstained by any moral corruption. And when we come into his presence, it is a frightening thing. It is a moment when we recognize that we are sinners. That's why Isaiah cried in Isaiah chapter 6, Woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips. He recognizes the moment we see God's holiness, we see our moral corruption. You say, Pastor, that's kind of a downer. No, that's a good thing. Because what God wants to do in that moment is change us and transform us. Listen, when you walked in here this morning, you may not have recognized God wants to change you. He wants you to encounter his holiness. He wants you to encounter his presence. And he wants you to walk away a changed person. Why? Because in his holiness, listen to this, we also encounter his incredible love. Oswald Chambers said this. Listen to what I say. He says, there is a danger of forgetting that the Bible reveals not first the love of God, but the intense blazing holiness of God with his love as the center of that holiness. You hear what he said? When God reveals himself, he shows us his holiness first. But in that is love. How do you know that? Because look what he's doing. He's inviting Abraham, or inviting Moses rather, into a relationship. He's saying, Moses, I've got something I want you to do. Ultimately, we're going to see what that is. Next week, we're going to focus a little more on this. But ultimately, what God is saying is, Moses, I've noticed what's going on with my people, and I love them, and I care about them, and I've come to do something about it. His holiness lays, lays the groundwork for us to understand his love. If you don't understand both, you don't understand God. He is holy and he's loving. So God reveals himself in extraordinary ways during ordinary moments. He, he reveals his holiness to meet our unrighteousness. But listen to this. God reveals his faithfulness to meet our infidelity. Exodus chapter 3, look what happens in verse number 6. Verse number 6. And he said, I am the Lord... Or, I'm sorry, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Abraham, God wants to make sure, right off the bat, Abram knows who he's talking to. Now, remember something. Moses had lived for 400, did I just say Abraham? I'm sorry, I meant Moses. Anytime that I say Abraham from here on out, just erase that and put Moses in, Okay. All right, but uh, um, okay, so, so what God wants to do is make sure Moses knows who's talking here. Now, you got to stop and think about this. Moses had lived and grown up in the house of Pharaoh. He is encultured from the day that he started growing up with Egyptian theology. He's not sure who he's talking to. Not only that, the children of Israel have become enculturated. What's happened is they kind of know their distant past. They don't know God very well. And so the very first thing is God wants to do is he wants to connect back to what he's already done. He says, here's who I am. I am the God of Abraham. Look at it, he says, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Now part of that is very familiar. God often introduces himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? He does that all the time in the Old Testament. He's going back and saying that I am the same God who spoke to Abram all the way back in Ur of the Chaldees. I'm the God of his son Jacob or Isaac. I'm the son of uh, his grandson or I'm the God of his grandson uh, Jacob. He wants to remind them of what he's done in the past. But I want you to notice something. He says to Moses, he adds a phrase. What does he add? Anybody notice? I'm the God of your father. He's not talking about Pharaoh. He's reminding Moses, you are part of my people. I'm the father. I'm the God of your father. And he's connecting himself. And he reveals, what he's doing here is revealing his faithfulness. 
God is going, look, you know, you guys have been living here for all these years. Uh, you don't know who I am. You, you, you've forgotten a lot about me. But I'm still faithful. Oh, isn't it good to know that when we're unfaithful, God is still faithful? I look back at my life, and I'd love to tell you that in my Christian walk, I have always walked steady and firm and, and did everything just right. But there's been moments where I backslid. I'm going to be honest with you. There's been moments this week I backslid. And there's been moments this week you backslid. There's been moments when we're unfaithful. But God here is reminding us in our un infidelity, in our unfaithfulness, in those moments when we fail, God is still faithful to us. He's going to remind them of this later on in Deuteronomy. He says, now know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Tozer said it this way. He said, upon God's faithfulness rests our whole hope of, human, of, of future blessedness. Only as he is faithful will his covenant stand and his promises be honored. That's good news. He's reminding us that what we're counting on is the fact that God never changes. He is faithful. Over the course of that 430 years and all of the trouble that Israel had had, God still remembered. He is still faithful. When they forgot who God was, he didn't forget who they were. When they're going through the problems uh, that they go through and they haven't even called on God, they don't even recognize him in this, in this book up until this time. But God had continued to work in their lives. And we go on and we could talk about that for days. Lamentations just simply, simply says it this way. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Amen? He is faithful. His faithfulness meets our infidelity. So what do we find out? God reveals himself in extraordinary ways in ordinary moments. He meets our uh, 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 he reveals his holiness to meet our unrighteousness. He reveals his faithfulness to meet our infidelity. Fourth, God reveals his compassion to meet our suffering. Look what he says in verse number seven, down to verse 10. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and we could go on. I want you to notice something. There are four verbs here that describe God's compassion for his people. Notice what they are. You can underline them in your Bible. First thing he says is, I have surely seen. Oh, isn't that good news? Isn't that good news? That God sees us in our, in, our, in our trouble. He sees what we're going through. I love that passage back in Genesis where Hagar is on the run away from Sarah. And there's all kinds of trouble going on in her life. And, and she's afraid that her son is going to die. And God shows up and, and he reminds her, I have seen you. I've seen you. I know what you're going through. There are moments in our life where we're going through troubles, where we're going through difficulties. Actually, this works in two different ways in our life. Sometimes we're in trouble, we're going through a hardship, and we wonder, does God know? Yes, he does. The Israelites in that day were going through a hardship. They are really being abused. They are really going through it. And God wants them to know, I see what you're going through. There's also another time. There are times when life is going good, and we start following in the sin, and we get into the mistaken notion that we can do things secretly and God won't know. He knows. I, I saw this illustrated many years ago at a pastor's conference I went to. They scared the bejeebies out of every preacher except for me. No, it was even me. Guy walks up on the conference. This is a, this is a pastor's conference. 5,000 pastors, Cliff. 5,000 pastors, Jacksonville, Florida. And the fellow walks up and he says, now, he says, I have a file here. He said, when you registered for your hotel, we uh, get a record of that. And we have a record of everything that you've searched on the internet and everything you've watched on television for the last week. And we've mailed a copy to your church. 
5,000 preachers immediately began to repent. You know why? Because probably all of us had sinned somewhere along the way. God knows. He sees. By the way, he was just joking with that. Praise the Lord. But more importantly, God sees and he knows. He reminds us about that. And he meets us in his compassion. Think about what that means. He says, I've seen. He says, I've heard. God's ear is always inclined towards his people. When you're going through trials, when you're going through difficulties, let me tell you what happened last year. I watched this over and over again over the course of these last 12 months. We had a lot of folks in our church. We really started off last year in tragedy. We really did. And God moved all through the course of the year. And over the course of the years, we've seen incredible blessings. We've seen God move in incredible ways. But we also, we also lost some folks. We saw people that went through incredible suffering and incredible difficulty. And here's what God's reminded us over and over again. No matter what you're going through, God's ear is inclined to you. He hears you. When we were crying out to him last year, this very time, crying out to him for help, and and, and, and it was really in just the way of family in our church had lost a dear loved one, and we're crying out, God, help us in the midst of that. He heard. And by the way, he answered in ways we could not have understood. He says, not only that, he says, I know you're suffering. I know what you're going through. He says that in the Old Testament. He can say that even in a greater way in the New Testament. Because in the New Testament, God is going to do something incredibly radical. He's going to enter into our suffering. He's not going to just know it from an intellectual, I know all things, I'm omni, you know, I'm all-knowing, I'm omniscient. He's going to actually put on human flesh, and he's going to come and live amongst us, and he's going to go through all of the troubles and all the difficulties we go through. That's why the Bible in Hebrews says he's a great high priest. He knows what we're going through. He has compassion on us. And then he says, I've come down to deliver them. God says, listen, Moses, I didn't just sit in the throne of heaven. I've come down. Remember, this is the angel of the Lord speaking to him. This is Jesus standing in the middle of this bush and going, I've come down, and I'm going to do something. And he is. In the remaining chapters of Genesis, he is going to come out and, and coach, he's going to conquer all of the Egyptian gods. Not only that, he's going to, he's going to by his powerful hand, deliver the people out of the, out of the land and bring them into the promised land. And all of that is an even greater preparation because one of these days, the same angel of the Lord was going to be born in Bethlehem as a baby. And he was going to grow up. And over the course of 30 years, he was going to live out the law perfectly. And then one day he died on the cross for us. Why? Because that's how God shows his ultimate compassion for his people. He reveals his compassion to meet our suffering. Fifth, God reveals his grace to meet our failures. Look what he says in verse 11. He said, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, but I will be with you, and this shall be a sign to you. Look what he says. He says, this will be a sign for you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Underline that little question that Moses asks, who am I? That's a great question, is it not? Moses is looking, and think about what's going on. Moses has lived his life. The last 80 years, he, or last 40 years, he has felt like an absolute failure. He grew up with a silver spoon in his mouth, grew up with all of these opportunities, grows up in the, in the house of Pharaoh with it all. He begins to have a compassion for his own people, the Hebrews, but his first attempt in his own flesh, by the way, to deliver them and do what God's called him to do results in utter failure. There are moments in our life, brothers and sisters, where we're going to fail, where we're going to mess up. Let me ask you this. How many of you have ever failed at something? Yeah. The rest of you need to try a little harder, quite frankly. The reality is we all fail, right? We all mess up. I can remember 
When we left West Virginia, we went to Virginia. And God had blessed us while we were in West Virginia immensely. Oh, my goodness. Every week we were seeing people get saved. The church was growing. Things were going well. And God began to move in my heart that it was time to move on. And, and, um, and um, I'll never forget, I went to the church and told them that. I said, God, I believe this is, we didn't have any place in mind. God, we think, is getting ready to move us and, and, and pray for us. And they did. And God moved us. And we moved into the outskirts of, of Richmond, Virginia, into a, into, into a uh, county that the county had like 400,000 people living in it. And uh, the church had been pastored uh, by a fellow named Stephen Smith. His dad was Bailey Smith, uh, one of the best evangelists at the Southern Baptist Convention, arguably, uh, has ever uh, um, uh, produced. Um, guy who knew all of the leaders. I thought, man, I am walking in high cotton. Goo, man. I ran, I ran into Owen Westbrook the other day. He's walking around my neighborhood with his mom. I'm glad to see he's still walking with his mom. And I said to him, man, he's serving at Bellevue Baptist Church. That's one of the largest churches in Southern Baptist Convention. That's where Adrian Rogers used to pastor. That's, that's where R.G. Lee pastored. I said, boy, you're walking in high cotton. And I was glad he had no idea what I was talking about. He's like, I'm just leading worship, man. I don't know what I'm doing. I like humility. I lacked humility when we went to Richmond. And God humbled me. <laughs> And I'll be honest with you, there were moments where I felt like an utter failure. That's what he felt like. Erwin Lutzer said this. He says, often we assume that God is unable to work in spite of our weaknesses, mistakes, and sins. We forget that God is a specialist. He was well able to work our failures into his plans. For 40 years, he's been training Moses. And it's great training. He said, Moses, you want to know what it's like to lead my people? Try these sheep for a little bit. All right? Try it. Now, by the way, if you know anything about sheep, that's not a really good comparison. They smell. They're stubborn. What were the Israelites like when he's walking around the winter? They, they smelled and they were, they were stubborn. They were difficult. God's training him. He's also teaching him, Moses, you can't do anything apart from me. Moses had tried it earlier in his face and now in his own strength. And now God has said, you don't have any, but I'm going to do something in you, Moses, or I'm going to do something special in you. I love what A.W. Pink says. He said, the discipline of the backside of the desert had not been in vain. Shepherding had chastened him. And he says, who am I? And let me just paraphrase this. God says, it doesn't really matter who you are. <laughs> let me tell you who I am. Isn't that good news? I don't care what God's calling you to do, whatever it is. He's not looking at you going, oh man, that guy is so talented. If I could get him on my team, just think what we could do. God's going, man, you ain't got much, but I can take you and use you in incredible ways because it's all about him. He had strengthened him. He had taught him an important lesson. And so he asked, who am I? And I noticed, notice how God answers that. First of all, he promises that he will be with him. He says, don't worry about it. I'm going to be with you, Moses. You don't have to worry about it. I'm going to take you. I'm going to do it. And then he gives him a promise. He said, Moses, when it's all said and done, remember this mountain. Remember this place, Moses, because I'm going to bring you right back here. That's where he's going to come. That's Mount Sinai. That's where he's going to receive the law later on. We'll look at that next week. So God reveals himself in extraordinary ways during the ordinary moments. He reveals his holiness to meet our unrighteousness. He reveals his faithfulness to meet our infidelity. He reveals his compassion to meet our suffering. He reveals his grace to meet our failures. And the final point is God reveals himself. God reveals himself in order to invite us into a relationship. Ah, this is probably one of the most important moments in all of the Old Testament right here. Look what God does. Verse 13. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, they will ask, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And Moses knows something. God, I don't really know much about you. And the Israelites don't know much about you. We've forgotten who you are. 
We remember the stories. Yeah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Yeah, we remember that. Our dads told us that. But we don't know much about you. Who should I say is sending them? Now, you have to understand something about God's response here very much. Your name revealed a lot about your character. Now, without picking on Jacob Myers too much, do you remember the story of Jacob we looked at a couple weeks ago? His name said something about his character. He was a deceiver. And we all know how deceptive Myers is. I'm sorry, Jacob is. Right? It reveals something about his character. What Moses is asking God is, tell me about who you are. And God is going to respond in a very unusual way. Instead of giving him a noun, he's going to give him a couple of verbs. <laughs> and he just simply says, look what he says. God said in verse 14 to Moses, I am who I am. That is an amazing statement in one sense. In one sense, it seems too dry. It's like, if you ask a kid your name and you said, who are, what's your name, little boy? And he said, I am who I am. He'd say, you little smart aleck. <laughs> but that's not what God's doing. It's actually two verbs that he puts together here. And literally what he says is I be because I be. I exist simply because I exist. And God is saying something so fundamental and so radical about himself. He's like, Moses, you got to understand who I am for a moment. Unlike you, I have no beginning and no end. Unlike you, I don't depend on anything else or anyone else for my existence. I simply am. And that's going to become the root, that little Little four letters in the Hebrew language. Yod, he, vav, he. We don't even really know how to pronounce it. Now, I don't want to give you a big Hebrew lesson, but let, let me explain this to you. In Hebrew, they don't put any vowels in. You have to supply the vowels. That's in all Hebrew writing. There's no vowels. You have to supply the vowels. And they put these little diacritical marks for you to know that. But over the centuries... This name was regarded as so sacred by the Jewish people that when they would come to it in the reading of Scripture, they would not pronounce this name. They felt like if you pronounce this name in an irreverent kind of way, it would be a great problem. So they, they, they didn't say it. In fact, they would, re, they would replace it either with, with the Greek or the Aramaic, either Adonai or Kyrios. It's indicated in your scripture when this word is being used because it will be Lord in all capital letters, the O-R-D, a little bit smaller than the L. It's a reminder to you in that moment, God is referring to his name. We will say it this way, Yahweh. The Germans said Jehovah because they're weird and they put J's when there should be Y's. This is God's covenant name. And he's revealing something about himself. He's saying, Moses, this is who I am. You simply tell him, I am sent you. I'm not a God like those other Egyptian gods. I'm going to show you that next week. He's going to go after one Egyptian deity after another, and he's going to say, I'm superior to all of them. And this name is going to become the basis. But listen to me. When you revealed to somebody's name in the Old Testament, you were inviting them into a relationship. And what God is saying to Moses is, Moses, I want to know you, and I want you to know me. I want us to be in a relationship with each other. Here's my name. You think about that. You remember back in the Old Testament? We had another guy ask this game. Jacob said, what's your name to the angel of the Lord? And the angel said, yeah, I'm not telling you anything. But now he says, I want to reveal myself in a very unique and very special. And throughout the rest of Exodus, he does. And I don't want to spoil the rest of the, the series, but he's going to show that he's their provider. He's going to show that he is their defender, that he's their lawgiver, that he is ultimately their savior. He's going to say, I'm going to show you who I am, and because of that, I'm going to invite you in. The greatest, listen to me, 
The greatest demonstration of God inviting us into a relationship comes in the New Testament. In March, I'm going to show you that Jesus takes these same names, that same name I am, and he's going to use it of himself throughout the Gospel of John. Why is he doing that? He's saying, this is who I am, and I'm inviting you to know me. Listen to me. God reveals himself not so that we can win trivia contests. God wants to reveal himself because he wants a relationship with us. The rest of the book of Exodus, if we think about it, really shows two amazing things. Number one, we have a problem. We've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. In Exodus chapter 20, he's going to say, let me give you 10 commandments and let's see how you do with these. <laughs> By the way, God knew how we were going to do with them. What he's doing in that is saying, let me show you, you have a problem. Don't lie, we lie. Don't cheat, we cheat. Don't, don't covet your neighbor's things. We covet our neighbor's things. He's reminding us there that we are sinners. But then in the other part of the book of Acts, what he's going to do is going to build a temple and a tabernacle, and he's going to say, this is how you approach me. And he's going to show them that you've got to come. In order for you to approach me, something has to die. And in the Old Testament, that's just a picture of something more glorious that we find in the New Testament. But this is how much God loves you. His greatest revelation of God's love and his character and his holiness comes on a cross. When Jesus Christ, the perfect lamb of God, went to the cross, and listen to me, he died in your place to reveal who he is. He reveals the righteousness of God, but he also reveals his love. And he invites you into a relationship with him. Isn't that a wonderful truth? This God who, who exists for all of eternity and creates everything that there is loves you so much that he's come down and entered into your suffering and he wants to give you a life. And today you've come here and you say, I don't even know why I came. Maybe you know why you came. Maybe you came because somebody invited you. Maybe you came because that's just what you do. Maybe you came for another reason. But I got good news for you. God even has a better plan. In the midst of an ordinary life, you've shown up, and God wants to show you himself. He says, here I am. Will you respond? Some of you today have never come to know him personally as Lord and Savior, and this is how you do it. The first thing you do is you admit that you're a sinner. You repent. You go in the wrong direction, time to turn around. Literally, you need to say to God, who am I? And the answer to that is, Lord, I'm a sinner. I've failed. I've blown it. Because of my sin, God, I'm separated from you. And then the Bible says you have to put your faith in Jesus. You have to trust him. You confess, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, but I believe that you died on the cross for me. I believe that, that you died to forgive me. And Lord, I give you everything that I am. And from here on out, I'm going to follow you. And you know what will happen? God will change your life. He changed Moses' life. And you can go across this room and he's changed a lot of your lives. If you've never experienced that today, I want to invite you to come to know him. Maybe you do know him. And maybe today, God, maybe this is a burning bush moment for you. And God is calling you to a task. Maybe he's calling you to share the gospel with somebody. Maybe he's calling you to a deeper walk with him. Maybe he's calling you to finally move off the sideline and, and become a member of the church and start getting involved. Maybe he's calling you into a deeper area of ministry, of service. Maybe he's calling you to break a relationship off or start a new relationship. Whatever it is, this is your burning bush moment. Will you respond?